I would now like to invite Dr. Tabir Lisner, Mr. Tan Guan Singh, and Mr. Johan Berlinde back for the panel discussion. And joining the panel now that's uh, Ms. He Qi Hui, who is the Senior Assistant Director of the Drainage Planning Department. Department uh, Division in the Catchment and Waterways Department of the PUB. She has 15 years of experience in planning, designing and implementing drainage and also the ABC Waters Project for Public Spaces in Singapore. So Chi Hui will be moderating the panel discussion session. So a reminder that you can still post your questions and vote for your favourite questions to be answered in the Slido platform, which is shown uh, in the QR code on the top right corner and the code is also shown there. All right, now let me hand over the floor to Qi Hui. Qi Hui, over to you, thank you. Hi, thank you, Ding Zi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, my name is Qi Hui. I think Ding Zi has did a very comprehensive introduction for me, so I'm not going to repeat what she said, but um, maybe just a few short words after I uh, heard the three presentations. So I think now is really a very exciting time to be a civil or environmental engineer. Right. With climate change, it looks to be a huge challenge, but I think with challenges, it's also the opportunity that we can come up with innovative solutions. And this could be something that could change the way our city looks in future. Okay, so, and we are reminded that uh, good engineering solutions can also look good. They do not have to look boring. Okay, so you have seen from some of the presentation slides on the Singapore Vision Park in Singapore or the Rotterdam Water Plaza. Okay, yeah, so uh, I think one big challenge that we have now is actually not just on engineering challenge, but it's actually the challenge of the change in mindset. Okay, so uh, as engineers, are we able to work with economists, work with architects, landscape architects, you know, in a multidisciplinary team to actually get the best solution? Okay, and for us as individuals living in a city, are we able to uh, adapt to changing climates by taking more ownership? Okay, for instance, what can we do during a flood? And also about participating in dialogues on what we want to see in our cities. Okay, so uh, I think many of you are now on the Slido, uh, putting in your questions. Maybe I'll start with a few questions of my own to the panelists, uh, to the speakers also. Yeah, so I think to, to all of you, I think today one common term that we came across is uh, this, this term called adaptation. So we often come across this term when we refer to climate change. So as we face with so many unknowns uh, that you can see today, how do we know that the adaptation measures that we are taking is good enough you know, for the future? So maybe we could start with um, Mr. Tan. Would you like to <laughs> start with this? <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean... Uh, your question is partly answered in one of my slides. <laughs> if you remember, yeah, uh, I showed a slide on the adaptation uh, framework, right? So I think it's important to have a framework of how you want to implement the adaptation measures. And the framework then guide all your decisions, right, in how you do it. So for example, like you have to first analyze the risk of the particular uh, impact of, of the climate change. And then you develop possible adaptation pathways. And after that, when you have the different uh, pathways, then you have to decide which one to adopt first because you different pathways will have different timeline of implementation, different costs of implementation. And so you have to work out what is the most cost effective at that point in time. But of course, you know the climate change, right? So it's very important that you continue to monitor the, the climate situation. And then at certain critical trigger point, we call them trigger point or tipping point, you know, that you may have to then change your adaptation pathway to suit the new environment. So it's very important that you have this framework in place, right? Then only can you make the, the, the right decisions uh, on what to implement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. <laughs> okay, I didn't arrow you for any reason, but I know you will have an answer for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can maybe we can move on to a Rotterdam where Mr. Valinda can share with us your experience, like uh, how about adaptation, you know, in the city of Rotterdam? What are the issues that you face on? Is it, are we doing enough? Is it too much or too little? Because there's always this thing about balancing costs versus, you know, um, being really safe. Yeah, so... Your, your views? 
Yeah, it, it's it's always a question that's also asked by the politicians, and the politicians they decide about budget, and they always say, okay, what should we do, and what will it cost if we do nothing? Well, and it's always a really tough question uh, to answer. They they would love to see just a business case about what we should do, but working with climate change, you have to make decision based on uncertainties. But one thing is certain that heavy rainfall will become more severe, droughts will become uh, more problematic, heat waves will become longer and it will become hotter. So doing nothing is not an option. Uh, and there's a bandwidth of uncertainty. So for us, it really helped that we now have this, 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 this framework, this program framework, where we really did the modeling of all those climate teams. So we really can show everyone what the problem will be, where the problem will be, and what kind of uh, solutions we can undertake. And then again, it's climate adaptation is always about, most of the time, about multifunctionality. It's not only about hardcore uh, engineering, so about pumps and, and sewage pipes. It also makes the city more attractive. So in that way, it also helps in uh, motivating politicians to invest in the climate adaptive city. It's still, it's always hard work after every election to motivate a new city council to invest in climate adaptation again because of those uncertainties. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think uh, we could also now go to a uh, doctor listener. So I think maybe just to spice this question up a little, uh, I would include it together with the, the first, um, the most voted question, which is also similarly on adaptation measures. So I think from your slide also, you have mentioned that, you know, the cost to invest in hard infrastructure is actually way lesser than the damages that it costs. But yet, you know, we still don't see that kind of investment, you know, in, in adaptation measures. So what do you think is the reason for that? And also, um, what do you think is the lowest hanging fruit, you know, that we should be targeting for in terms of water adaptation? Yes, thanks a lot for, for this super, super important question. Um, and and obviously not not an easy answer for it, but I but I think um it's it's an interesting it's the, the, to me, uh, I guess, knowing a lot about about the the climate impacts, it is quite baffling that it's still so not well known what the scale of the costs may be if we do nothing, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. And I guess it's it's yeah, it, it's part of this um, yeah, it, just not not fu fully fully understanding that yet. And I think it's very important to continue um, the focus on really on really showing that. But I think. Um, um, Johan just also raised a very important point that, and I guess also uh, very impressively, both of the presentations also showed that, that it's beneficial in, in a lot of areas, the climate resilient development. No, I mean, it can make a city very, very attractive. And the presentation really made me want to move to Rotterdam basically right away. Um, and I think that's a really important point. It's not a, it's not a like, you know, it's not an ugly dam that you build somewhere, but it's really an integration of, um, a participatory process where you ensure that also the the priorities of the community are taken into account to to improve the overall yeah to the overall structure there and i guess that's um that also i guess brings me to the to the low hanging fruit i think that's um it's very important to recognize that in 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 um in comparison to mitigation adaptation is a is a very local process also and needs to be integrated into the community and there isn't necessarily a one size fits all like i i, I think the the approach of, of really learning between the two cities between between singapore and rotterdam who, who share similarities is one of the very, really really good examples to find like a partner situation where you, where you can learn but then still um yeah, really work with with the community to make sure that the acceptance is also there because there also needs to be a shared understanding of, for example, what what is the level of risk that we are willing to accept, and then being able to to develop pathways that that are adjustable to that um, to that yeah continu continuously changing situation. So there's certainly some. It, I mean, for example, early warning systems are certainly something that is a low hanging fruit and there's no reason for not having that. Right. And, and I think the, the flooding in Germany, for example, was one of the best examples that is just it's simply unacceptable that 
that you would incur such um, such fatalities um, simply because you don't have a good early warning system. No? So I think this is certainly something at, at the very uh, kind of immediate part of adaptation that should be should be done everywhere. But then, um, yeah, in terms of other options, I think it's very, very local and regional and really needs to be a participatory process that, um, yeah. I'm glad that you brought up this point because I think it kind of leads us to um, the third question here on in order to work towards a climate-proof city, you need to engage a lot of people and stakeholders. So it, it seems like I think all of us do kind of agree that people is one of the, um, the biggest issue. I mean, in addition to the government, it's one of the bigger issues that we also have to deal with in terms of uh, coming up with climate-proof uh, city. So um, what do you think, um, what are your views in terms of like uh, engaging stakeholders? Maybe uh, Mr. Valinda could share your views. Yeah, thank you. That's, this is uh, a question that's, that's really important in, in, in making the climate adaptation program broader and also that it lands with all the people that have to work on it. Um, and years ago, our climate adaptation started by our water department, so the engineering department. But we now see with everything we do on climate adaptation, that's also becoming a social problem and a health problem. So within my, my program, I'm in the early stage, I already hired all those different uh, uh, people also to, to, to show other perspectives on the problem because it's really important to speak those different languages because only with, with the engineering language, we, I don't think we can motivate everyone. And again, we also need all, all, also the citizens even to, to, to work on climate adaptation. And we already saw that that was quite a challenge because there are 42 neighborhoods in Rotterdam and all those 42 neighborhoods are completely different. So we even have tailor-made uh, uh, dialogues with every, every neighborhood. We also bring it more closely to ourselves. Um, climate adaptation, yes, it is about multifunctionality. And again, that's the biggest challenge because uh, building a, a water plaza, you might think, okay, that is a project from the water department, but no, there's green on there. There is, uh, there's some pavement. So you need the green department, the road department, the water department, also make sure they coordinate. So you really need people that are able to look on a broader sense on what's needed for the city, not only thinking about only their asset. And I think that, so it's, 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 it's a real challenge to, to motivate everyone with your story to work on climate adaptation. I think you, you need an attractive story. Um, be confident in what you share. So modeling and and and, uh, and data helps, uh, and and also a good story. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because I think I personally went through that. So uh, I'm also an engineer by training. So I think it it's uh, it helps to speak another department's language. Like you know, when you go to the transport department, you know you understand what they are facing. You know, you go to the trees people, they know that, okay, you know, you need to cut the trees, but you'll give them something back. So I think it's about, you know, speaking the different languages in order to tie everybody back to this big goal of, you know, what we need to do best for the city. I think Mr. Tan also has uh, quite yeah. a bit of experience to share yeah, yeah. You know, in terms of public engagement. Yes. Can I add on to this? Yeah. Yes, sir. I think I think for, for climate change is a bigger issue, a bigger problem because uh, the, the stakeholders are so diverse, right? Um, you have the very young, like the children, to the elderly, or the, or the men in the street, to the policy makers, or even the professionals, to the special interest groups. So, so each one of these stakeholder groups, you know, they have their own uh, concerns and interests. So how do you then actually address all, them, all of them, right? Um, so for us, for example, like the, in the coastal protection, right, when we, mm. when we try to go to the public to explain to them what mm. needs to be done, right, for coastal mm. protection against sea level rise, we, we try to break down the, the, the problem into geographical areas because a lot of these solutions are site specific, yeah. So, so for different areas, they will have different issues. So once you break it down into smaller regions, then maybe it's easier to handle. And also then we will try to explain to them the trade-off because uh, most of the time people want uh, their solution, you know, but we will tell them that if you have this solution, then somebody else will have to give up something. Yeah, so it's, it's a question of trade-off. 
And, and finally, it's also your method of engagement, right? So for different stakeholder group, you need to have different methods of engagement. So for example, like the, the special interest group, right? Or the professionals, what we, we did was we had special focus group discussions with them. So rather than a, a big town hall meeting, for example, with the residents or the community. So for different stakeholders, you must tailor yeah, the way you want to uh, engage them also. Yeah, so, so that's how we did it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Listener, do you have anything else to add regarding that on a community engagement? Uh, no, okay. If not, maybe I can go to the next question that uh, I think is to ask to all three speakers. Okay, it's not here, but I think it's something that I gathered from uh, some discussions. Like tackling the impact of climate change is not something that one government agency can do on its own. So in your experience, how do different government agencies or private developers work together to implement climate adaptation measures? Yeah, so um, Dr. Listener, do you, would you like to start? Um, yes, uh, I think it's a super important question and probably the details would be better addressed by, by the other panelists uh -huh. since I usually have a more global view. Mm -hmm. But I think one, one, one very important aspect kind of is that of course adaptation on when it when it actually happens on the ground is within a decision making framework and uh, i guess there's there's also national level frameworks that also then then provide some of the some of the structures in which um in which uh, the decisions can actually operate and i think um the 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 national adaptation planning process is is a very important kind of building block um also in in providing already the linkages of where priorities are set in yeah in 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 establishing synergies um between um between different sectors but then of course um yeah i guess um it, on the on the actual local level and the implementation level where where then the decisions have to be made that um that is uh something that I would refer to the other panelists, yeah. Maybe Mr. Tan, do you have uh, to share your experience? <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. It's always a challenge to get different government agencies to work together, yeah. But uh, thankfully in Singapore, we have quite a, how would I say that? Yeah, we have a very top-down structure, yeah. So, so for climate change, actually we have an inter-ministerial committee on climate change. So that is where... Uh, ministers from different ministries actually form this committee and then they will decide the, actually the big picture, the overall uh, messaging and, and the trust. Then below that, you have the Resilience Working Group, right, which is chaired by two permanent secretaries of the Ministry of National Development and Ministry of uh, Sustainability and Environment. So this, this working group actually is the one that actually coordinates and oversees all the implementation for the climate adaptation measures, yeah. And it's, it's only when you have this kind of interagency committee, right, that you can actually get them to work together to implement the things in the most effective way and that everybody's interest then is taken care of. Right? Yeah. So that's how we do it. Right. And I think maybe just to also add on to Mr. Tan's point is that we, we noticed that a lot of solutions now will not be respecting boundary lines or ownership lines. So a lot of these are cross-boundary solutions or cross-ownership kind of solutions. So and all the more there's a need to actually engage uh, the various government agencies to work together for a common solution. Yeah, so maybe we can go to uh, Mr. Valinda. You know, you mentioned about weather-wise 2030, you know, it, it looks like a plan that really includes everybody has to come in and play their part. So, you know, with such a plan, how do you get everyone to buy in and make this work? Yeah, and and and, and weather-wise is only the, the local program for Rotterdam. And in the Netherlands, we have quite a strong uh, governance structure for, for water management because we're mm -hmm. on a national level. We have the Delta program mm -hmm. and they are really involved in, in investment in the, in the primary flood defenses, storm surge barriers. Uh, they have a big budget that's even outside of the decision making of the of the national uh, politicians and then on a local level you have the the the, 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 the local government so the city but we have to work together with the water authorities and the water authorities are another political entity um, you have 21 of those in the netherlands and in rotterdam we have three uh, mm -hmm. and we need close collaboration with them because they are responsible for the wastewater treatment plants surface water and the flood defenses within the city perimeter. And we as a city are responsible for collecting and transporting stormwater. 
that governance structure is already there for years. So that really makes sure that we have to work together. Even the people pay designated taxes to the city and the water authority only on water management. So that also makes sure that we have a budget that also helps in coordinating with other agencies. Uh, but now also with the teams of heat and drought that are new topics for us, we need to engage other agency to work, work with us and even also private entities like real estate developers, uh, social housing corporations. Uh, and that just takes a lot of time. First, we start with discussions. And then over time, we also sign agreements with each other that become more concrete in every step of the way. Uh, and I think it's also the thing, it's not something you arrange in a year. It takes time to, 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 to join forces. Uh, and it also helps to do one good project with each other. It's most of the time a starting po point for doing, doing more. So having examples in the city also helps. Yeah, thank you. So maybe just to add on to, to what you have mentioned also, so how do you actually engage this um, real estate developer? Because they are, as you mentioned, like 60% are private. So, you know, they are not really being a government entity. So what kind of leverage do you have or how do you convince them to actually be on your site in this endeavor? Yeah, it's, it's on, on multiple levels. So first of all, we do a lot of... Um, motivation to them so i do a presentation and i tell them okay building in rotterdam it's 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 people want to live they'll want to work here because you live next to the water at the same time building here brings some responsibilities because you are building in a bathtub uh, uh you are building in a, in a heat environment so add that to your development and that works but only for the most expensive development, because then there is budget for adding climate adaptive measures to your development. What we also do is just uh, putting it in the rules and regulations. So in the building codes that if you want to build in Rotterdam, at the moment, you now have to be sure that you can store 50 millimeters of rain. It's, we want to do more, but that's a starting point. So every building in Rotterdam needs to do that. And over time, we add more rules to those building codes. So every real estate developer has to do so. Also for the, uh, 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 the, the not the most expensive development. So also everyone in the city benefits from those rules and regulations. Okay, thank, thank you for sharing that. Maybe we'll go back to Dr. Listener. I think there's the top two questions that's actually uh, addressed to you. So the first one would be, maybe you could explain to the layman what does medium and high confidence refer to in the context of IPCC? Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a very central uh, central component, I guess, of, of, of the reports. Um, so th the reports don't do their own research, but it's an assessment of existing um, peer reviewed literature. And to be able to have this common language, because it's also so important for policymaking, um, there is this structure of of agreement um, and evidence which translates into into confidence so you might have for example 10 studies on on the same topic and um, and that means that there's a lot of evidence that um that a certain topic is relevant but then you might also have um an agreement or not not agreement projections um as as we all know do have a lot of uncertainty so there might be um, around flood protections, if you have different studies looking into different models, they might actually have a very strong modeling spread and might even disagree on some of the outcomes. So depending on, on, the, on the combination, I guess you kind of have a matrix structure out of this as a combination of the of the amount of evidence and the and the agreement. Um, we we can we 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 document the, the level of confidence. Um, so high confidence always means that there is a lot of evidence and there is a lot of agreement. So these are really the most robust statements, and they're really the ones that then um, are are taken into the summary for policymakers that are really non, you know, th these are kind of non-negotiable outcomes. These, this is very robust science. Whereas medium evidence can can or, or medium confidence can either mean there is a lot of evidence, but there's some some disagreement still of the direction, or simply that there's only limited studies, but those are very robust in the same in the same direction. Thank you for explaining that because I think I had that at the back of my mind as well. So I think I think maybe we could just quickly move to the second question, which is also addressed to you. So, uh, Dr. Lister, could you kindly explain why the future benefits and barriers? Sorry, just moved. Hang on. 
I think the question has moved. <laughs> Give me a minute. Uh, okay, they brought it back. Okay, could you ex kindly explain why the future benefits and barriers to adaptation oh, in the that. area of WASH oh, were not affect people who are so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is a really important question also. So um, and I, I briefly mentioned that, um, that the assessment of future effectiveness that we did is very much limited by what is currently being um, being assessed because for the IPCC report, we can only draw on, on existing literature and there simply aren't quantitative projections of um, the effectiveness um, of adaptation in the WASH sector, even though this is obviously a very, very essential sector and would be one that I believe also could could be modeled quantitatively. Um, I mean, more, more, you know, um, approaches like behavioral approaches are simply, it's it's not something that you can really quantify, even though they're super essential, but a lot of the, the WASH interventions certainly would would um, lend themselves. But currently there wasn't, wasn't any literature. Um, yeah. But it's still assessed in detail in the report um, as such in terms of what is happening now and what are options that have, have shown to be effective um, up to date. There's, they simply haven't been included in the projections. Okay, thank you. Okay, hang on. I think someone um, raised their hand in the chat. So would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello? Maybe the host could help. Miss Paul Li Ping. Hey, hi Li Ping. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? Uh, would you like to address this too? Sorry, okay. Maybe let's move on. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Some, okay. Uh, Lippi, so, you can type in the chat. Thank you. Okay. I think the next question is from Mr. Tan. So uh, do you have any advice on drainage adaptation okay, for places with strong reg or less strong regulatory frameworks and building codes than Singapore? So uh, when faced with that, um, any advice for, for, for them? Uh, Mr. Tan, I think you're muted. <laughs> May I unmute? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I said there was just a, yeah, yeah, it's quite a tough question. Yeah, because every, every country will have their own challenges, right? So what works for Singapore may not work for your country, yeah. So I presume, uh, yeah, Mr. Samuel Tregron, yeah, from some uh, another country, lah, yeah. So what our advice is, uh, you should maybe seek uh, assistance, right, from uh, either World Bank or ADB. They have programs where we they can provide training for 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 uh, countries like that. So Singapore, we are very happy to always to share our expertise. So like when you go to them, then they may even ask Singapore to come and to you know, give you uh, some training, that kind of thing. So really, we have to see the context that you have la, to be able to know what works in your country. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Tan. Okay, I think moving down one more to Dr. Listener. So I think I think uh, this was a notice from your slides that South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Asia will be facing more floods. So uh, what's the assessment or impact on temperature rise, especially on the Himalayan rivers? And will we be seeing drying up of these rivers leading to more droughts and food shortages? Uh, Dr. Listener, your views? Yes, thank you. Um, also, of course, um, a very important question. There's, I mean, there, there's limits to to what um, the IPCC report um, in in this kind of global approach is really able to cover. Um, one of the kind of high level results that we've certainly seen is that um, mountain and, and glacier and, and snow runoff dependent ecosystems um, and, and systems like, like the Himalayan region um, are certainly also very much affected by temperature change and then um, accordingly by changes in, in snow melt and for um, I mean, for, for all of the glacier regions in the world, but of course also in, in, in the Himalayan region, um, we see that, um, mm. that th there's hugely accelerated melting rates also for, for glaciers. And in some cases, the peak melting rate, if you will, has already been, been reached, which means that 
on the long run, there will be a reduction in, in runoff out of, out of these um, uh, melting processes, which of course will have very important implications for, for water security and then by extension also food security. Um, but um, yeah. Um, I guess it, it's always the, the, the there. There's many, many more regional studies that that are available to to then look into the into the details of this. But it's certainly a, a very, very important topic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Listener. And uh, I think the next question, the next two questions, actually, I think we have is addressed to Mr. Valinda. So uh, I think both questions. I think they are asking about the um, some kind of a, how do you weigh the solution? So. Um, pumping solutions, storing in the water plaza versus pumping to a reservoir of one kilometers away. So how do you weigh this uh, sort of a pump solution versus a traditional uh, gravity flow drainage solution? I think that's what this is asking. Maybe you could share your views. Yes. Um, so the first thing is that we do a lot of modeling. So on a neighborhood no level, we know the storage deficit in every neighborhood. So the amount of water that needs to be stored in order to make sure that combined with the sewage system and uh, water storages with expected uh, heavy rainfall, we will keep the city dry. Um, uh, looking only at, those, at this uh, water plaza, the primary thing we want to do is uh, let it drain under on the gravity or infiltrate into the subsurface. Um, but we saw that with our modeling and 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 uh, that it was we weren't able to infiltrate all the water that we store on the on the water plaza into the subsurface because of a lack in infiltration capacity. So and again, the water plaza is made to reduce the stress on the sewage system. So we don't want to let it flow into the sewage system. So on this location, it was a good solution to add a pump to it, to just pump it a kilometer away. Uh, but it, it's just, Rotterdam is very flat, so we don't need a lot of pumping capacity to pump water up. It's just to pump it uh, horizontally away uh, one kilometer. So yeah, it's, it's, it's based on modeling and, and location and it was on this location a good solution. Yeah, thank you. I think there's also another follow-up question, which is how do you uh, measure the, the trade-off between building the water storage uh, for the parking garage and you know how do you convince the decision makers that they should be investing in that kind of solutions which is sometimes a bit unconventional and then you don't exactly yeah. have very good statistics on what's the benefits that could come about from it. True, true and and again on this location in the city centre we have a huge storage deficit, deficit for water so we need to add a lot of, lot of water storage to the city centre where we don't have any space to do so. So we cannot add surface water to it. So we really have to find it in everything we do. And then when you build a, a, a car par parking garage like this, where you are going to excavate, it is a possibility to add a, add a huge water storage to it. And it was also very convenient that the main sewage pipe from the city center, so that collects all the storm water and sewage water from the city center, ran it was just before uh, the project location of the of the of the parking garage, so that made it convenient to do so. Yeah. So again, knowing that you need to store water, the project that is there, and then there were some lucky circumstances which made it this the best solution there. I see. I think the important part is basically like what you mentioned in your. Um, your, your presentation is to have a plan first or master plan first so when the opportunity comes in and then that's when you put that plan into action, right? Yeah, okay. True, true. Yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Tan, anything you want to share about Singapore's experience in terms of, um, you know, building such, such innovative facilities? How do you convince the decision makers to invest the money in, in, in building something that we have never even like, you know, seen before and know it will work? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, yes, uh, the same question also we have, lah, right? How do you convince the developer to put in that detention tank, right, in their development when it actually is serving a public good, right? Um, so, so in the same way, I think we have to convince them of the beneficial uses of it, lah. So, so like um, for some of this development now, right, when they build the detention tank, when they store the rainwater, they can then later on pump it out to use it for irrigation and for watering needs, yeah, to wash the, 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 the ground floor, that kind of thing. So in a sense, once they see that actually there's a benefit to store the water for their own use, 
right? Then they are actually uh, more, more ready, right? Even to, to implement such schemes. And uh, just to make a point also that in Singapore, we have a separate stormwater and sewage system, all right? And not like the Netherlands, it's a combined system. So it makes it easier for us because it's separate. So the clean water only goes to the drain and then the, the dirty water goes to the sewers. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, I think that... Okay, there's one that's on... Hang on, uh. Yeah. I think there's one, one question that is uh, addressed to all, which is um, there's been consideration for how to incorporate rapidly increasing aging population in the respective cities, okay, globally in climate adaptation strategies. Okay, so I think uh, in Mr. Tan's slides, he shared a lot about uh, naturalized canals, green spaces. But I think in Singapore, we are also uh, conscious that we don't have that much land spaces, you know, and our, our storms come very quickly. So there's also safety concerns. So, uh, how do we think that we can still address climate change and also look at how this could, you know, uh, this could be used for the uh, increasingly aging population? So how could it benefit from this climate adaptation strategies? Uh, Mr. Tan or Dr. Listener, would one of you like to, to start on this? I think it's addressed to all. <laughs> Dr. Lister? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to share, share more more general perspective. I guess I think mm -hmm. one point that 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 Johan also just just um, highlighted is really the um, to not consider adaptation as an afterthought, kind of, but to really um, ensure that whatever projects are being implemented, especially in terms of infrastructure, that it's something that is integrated into that thinking. And I guess um, the aging population is one 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 aspect to this as well that that is not necessarily separate, but it's always much harder to to retrofit something that has already been put in place and then um, yeah change that in in um, afterwards rather than um, really making sure that the of course adaptation is one priority within within um different different ones um so to really um have that as a set of, of criteria that really different components i think is, is very very important yeah but that's more general yeah mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah maybe just to to add on to that is that it's very important yeah like what dr listener say that you have to design it uh, right from the beginning right so if you know that your, your, your project is going to have to cater for the elderly people, right? Uh, then you have to make sure that uh, the space that you allow them to, to go to are safe, all right? And, if, and for those places that are not safe, then you should have, you have some kind of a, a soft barrier or the way you design it such a way that, that then the, the elderly people or, or the people on wheelchair and so on will not go there. See? So all this thing has to be taught right through from the beginning, yeah. Then only it will be able to, to, to cater for all the different uh, stakeholders, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tan. Uh, how about Mr. Melinda? Uh, anything to share regarding this? Yeah, that's what what's already been said. Is I totally agree. It's it's really important to 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 see this as a boundary condition for every project you do. Um, but we also have a, a group of uh, colleagues who have the Inclusive Climate Action Rotterdam uh, um, group, and they, well, everything we do, um, they give us advice how to make it more uh, inclusive, more accessible to everyone in the city. So if we do project without thinking in the right way about inclusive and about aging population, they certainly motivate us to do so. It's just really important to make it inclusive for everyone in the city. Oh, that's interesting to hear that you have actually a team of people to look into that aspect. I think uh, from our own experience, when we did Bishan Park as a naturalized river, I think we also considered this, like, you know, some of the elderly, they may like to enter the naturalized river, but they may not be able to be mobile enough to do so. So I think when we designed, we put in uh, platforms, lookout platforms, which um, you can actually wheel the wheelchair to. You know, it's still safe enough. You know, the water will not get there, but yet they have a good view of the river. So I think increasingly, we are getting more and more of such requests, you know, when um, they are building social facilities, nursing home to say, can we have it near some of your um, green infrastructure? So I think that there really is a potential to um, look at, you know, managing this, uh, how aging population 
plus also you know allow them to uh, enjoy some of these facilities which are built for climate adaptation. Yeah, so I think we are almost at five thirty. Yeah. So maybe I will just uh, go one round, you know, to uh, our various uh, speakers to say if you have any uh, last comment to add. Uh, to this very interesting uh, webinar that we have today. So maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Listener. Any, uh, anything else to share? Uh, well, maybe, maybe mainly to say that I've, I've, from my, from my global IPCC perspective, found it very encouraging to, to, to hear about those very, very exciting examples of how adaptation can play out in practice, and really to see a lot of the components that, that scientifically we, we've, you know, um, outlined what would be important um, to consider for adaptation. So the adaptive pathways idea that you, that you stay flexible, that it's integrated, that you have different, different, um, that you consider the different aspects together. I find that very, very encouraging to see that it, this is being implemented um, in practice. Um, so it's been, yeah, a very valuable, very valuable panel for me um, as well. So maybe just as a personal reflection, thanks a lot uh, for that. Thank you very much for your sharing too. I think maybe we go to uh, Mr. Valinda. Do you yeah, have uh, anything I, else to share? I think that maybe it was not? very... Yeah, I was very inspiring to also hear the other speakers. Uh, I'm only motivated even more to, to, to continue my work. And I'm, I also want to say, uh, if you are, uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, be, please feel free to uh, get in touch. Uh, I'm really uh, happy to help. Uh, and I, as I said also in my presentation, that we just launched our new program framework, translated into English. So I'm also happy to share that uh, to all of you. Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, we welcome both you, Mr. Valinda, and uh, Dr. Listener to Singapore. You know, if you can have the chance to travel here, yeah, we're yeah, most happy to meet us. you in person and show you some of uh, our sites. So, last, I'll get uh, my okay. boss, Mr. Tan, yeah. <laughs> to share no, some no, uh, yes, yes. Clothing, I think, clothing, uh, clothing. Yeah, we would like to love to see uh, Johan and Listener come to our Singapore International Water Week <laughs> next year. Yeah. Okay, just to sum up, in fact, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, Dr. Listener was talking about the scientific basis, right, for all the climate change and all that. And then uh, Johan gave us a, a very beautiful picture of what, what we can have, you know, a dream, that kind of thing. So for Singapore, it's, we are very focused on the technical part, the engineering part. So I would say that actually, for as, as, a, as a concluding statement, uh, it's, it's important that for when we look at all this climate adaptation, that it must first of all be based on very sound scientific evidences. Yeah. And so the science must really form the basis for all your action. And then with the sound engineering and, and you know and the good stakeholder engagement, you can then realize the dream, right, that we want to have, right, for our future. And so so basically, yeah, that will be my my talk for this day. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, you know, at 5.30, so I won't hold everyone else back. Let me I'll pass back uh, to Jingzi. I'd like to take over. Yes, thank you, Tihui, and also the panelists for answering the many questions. And I saw that there are still many that are unanswered. But uh, anyway, thank you for the plentiful questions coming in. And also thank you to the panelists for giving us your guidance and advice related to inland climate adaptation and I'm sure that we have all benefited a lot from the sharing. So coming back to this, so since we have come to the end of the webinar, we would like to seek your help again to scan the QR code shown on the screen.